about next class in February. That's the rivers class. That will be looking at watersheds, their functions, their structure, how they interact. Um, you'll notice on the schedule that we're over at the Stan Adams training facility. It's a forestry site. It's off of the Jordan Lake. So it's on the banks of the Jordan, or on the edge, sorry, of the Jordan Lake. Um, right now, it's really, really flooded kinds of conditions over there. So our original plan was that we'll be going outside. Brianna Jones, who is a biologist with the Wildlife Resource Commission, who studies freshwater mussels and their impact on water quality, and she'll be bringing some samples and some things for you all to look at. We're going to go over there in a little closer to class and do a little scouting and just see. So I don't know if we're going to be inside, outside, you know, lots of water in February, right? So, but I'll let you all know on email. I would really encourage you to spend some time with the website for that class. There are great resources. There's a ton of maps, um, identification guides, publications from agencies. So do be sure to check out all the resources that are there for you. I think the class will be a lot more meaningful for you if you've taken a little bit of time and looked at the website beforehand. Um, I think Ashley has requested a listserv from the university. I think you'll probably see that next week. So I'll be sending a listserv login for you. You can join or not, but it'll be a tool that will allow you all to sort of talk to each other in a little bit more meaningful way. Um, so I'll be looking for that next week. If you didn't grab an evaluation form on your way in, be sure to grab one of those. Same thing as last time. There's a it's a very cleverly identified box right out front. You can drop your name tags if you want. Some of you didn't bring back your name tags, so she'll uh, not mock you publicly. Um, but if you want to leave your name tags with us, that's fine, and drop your evaluation form. Um, I had a set of books last class, and I don't, and again, you don't have to be publicly shamed by claiming them, but just make sure to get them from me if you left your books behind. Okay. Um, at this point, I'm going to stop and turn it over to Johnny Randall. So Johnny is um, the longtime um, director of conservation here at the Botanical Garden. He retired in June? July. July. So, but he's gracious enough to, to join us. I, I have to say, when we were planning this program, Johnny was probably the first instructor I reached out to, and he wonderfully said, yeah, of course I'll help. And then I had the good chance, the good fortune of being able to go to everybody else and say, well, Johnny Randall <laughs> is teaching. And they're like, oh, of course I'll join you right away. So um, he's wonderful. I, as a student in the Native Plant Certificate Program here at the Garden, which, sidebar, I would commend to those of you who are interested in Native Plants. I've had the great fortune of taking classes with him. He's wonderful. So at this point, I'm going to stop and turn it over to Johnny Randall. So there you go. Well, thank you for that introduction. Um, so I've spoken in this room many, many times, and I have never figured out the best way to do this. Uh, one time, I won't do this today, but um, once I stood actually in the back of the room and faced the screen, and everybody just looked at the screen, and I was behind talking, and that worked great. Um, um, people didn't have to look at me, um, and they could just look at the slide. But at any rate, I will wear this just in case there's someone part of hearing like myself. Or part of seeing, you can't see where the button is to turn this on. There we go. And you can cut this part out of the, uh, the recording. Uh, 
How is that? Is that good? Okay. All right. So um, we're going to talk about FAR systems today, and um, I am going to concentrate on the understory rather than the canopy. I'll talk a little about the canopy. It's important, but um, but the, I'm going to concentrate on understory uh, information, and we will get a chance to have a field trip. Um, like Lee said, down to the Piedmont Nature Trails and actually experience some understory. So this is the outline I'll try and follow today. And um, so our field trip leaders, we have three. Um, Brandon Wheeler, who is the new conservation ecologist here at the North Carolina Botanical Garden. Jeffrey Neal, who is the curator of the Coker Arboretum. And the, the famous and infamous Matt Jones back there in the corner. So these are some, some of the things that I'll cover today. Um, but I first wanted to just start out talking about where forests are um, and, and where we are. So we are in the, um, <clears throat> the temperate forest region. Um, so it's this uh, symbol down here. So there's temperate forests here, in South America, Asia, um, Europe. Uh, so there's a lot of temperate forests around the world. And those are the kinds of ecosystems that we'll be talking about today. But if you narrow it down a little more closely, um, you can see that we, well, you might not be able to see that very well, um, but we are in the Piedmont ecoregion. And there is lots of forest in that Piedmont ecoregion. And this gives you a little better depiction of where that is. So uh, it stretches from about Montgomery, Alabama, up to New York. Um, so, uh, so the plants and animals that occur um, within this ecoregion are more similar to one another than outside of other ecoregions. So, for example, uh, the plants and animals um, here in Chapel Hill and Raleigh are more similar to one another around Atlanta, Georgia, than the plants and animals here and in Smithfield, North Carolina. Okay, so um, it has a lot to do with climate, soils, things like that. Um, then you can narrow it down even further to what are called uh, level, uh, two, level three and level four eco, um, eco regions. Um, and that red dot is where we are today. Um, so we are right in between two different eco regions, two different Piedmont um, sections. Uh, the one toward Raleigh is the Trask Basin, and we are in uh, the southern Piedmont eco region here. And I threw this slide in because I didn't want to forget. We have an entire series. I say we. Okay, so I worked at the Botanical Garden here for 25 years, and I still say we. I will always be <laughs> and get away from saying we. Uh, so uh, the garden is having this incredible um, array of programs that uh, are based on the people are based on the savannas. And if you haven't um, signed up for these, it's all free. Most of the talks are hybrid, so you can tune in um, on uh, your computer um, or come here in person. But these are just an incredible um, series of talks on savannas, so I really recommend that. And there's, um, I'll just mention that the understory in savannas, for instance, in wet pine savannas in eastern North Carolina, there's greater plant diversity there than almost anywhere else on Earth at a small scale. Within a one meter square area, there can be as many as 50 different plant species. Um, when you get to larger and larger scales, like square miles, things like that, it's tropical rainforest. But, but at the small scale, um, our eastern um, wet pine savannas are, are right there. So um, I'll, I'll just concentrate a little bit on the geology of this area. Um, it's very complex. Uh, if you look at the geology of North Carolina, it's incredibly complex. Uh, so where, uh, where that blue dot is right now, on the far right, we're right there, and you can see there's um, all these different soil types, uh, different uh, rock types, that weather to a lot of different soil types. So the different forests are gonna develop on different soils. And so we have a variety of different forest types on the botanical garden natural areas. And this is an example of uh, the soils that are derived from those rocks. Uh, I know you're going to have uh, talks on soils and you'll learn a lot about soils. Uh, I'm not a soil person, but I love looking at soil maps and uh, seeing how that relates to forest structure and composition. Um, but at any rate, in that little um, 
that little ser uh, section right there, the area of interest, the AOI. So if you ever go to this site, it is so wonderful to just poke around, look at soils. You can draw a little uh, ring around what you want to look at and go look at the soils and soil types. So um, I recommend you do that uh, if you can. But there are 35 different soil types just right in that one area of interest. And so um, it has a lot to do with plants that occur there. So just recently, um, the fourth approximation of the natural communities in North Carolina has been released. This was written by Mike Shafley of the North Carolina Natural Heritage Program. And this is an example of some of the uh, forest types in the Piedmont. Now this isn't all of them, uh, but it's just some of them. And this is uh, available free online, or you can order a hard copy from the North Carolina Natural Heritage Program. But um, it is so comprehensive, it will blow your mind. So I really re highly recommend having a peek at this. So why am I showing you this picture um, of the Morgan Creek Valley 18,000 years ago? Because things change over time. Um, and so this was more of an alpine type zone back 18,000 years ago. There were uh, woolly mammoths and ground sloths and armadillos, but a lot of the plants that occurred back then are still around today, the same species. Uh, so it's really amazing to think about that. And one of the plants that we will not see today, um, but it is just on the other side of the nature trail along Morgan Creek, um, are these Ice Age relic purple rhododendrons, rhododendron catopiensi. So the population of those rhododendrons have been there for over 18,000 years. Um, not the same individuals, of course, but those populations have been there. So when the glaciers retreated, they weren't here. They didn't get any further than uh, the Ohio River. But at any rate, um, this was an alpine zone. These plants ordinarily occur about 4,000 feet in North Carolina. And, uh, but they found a hospitable place on the north facing slope next to a creek where it doesn't get too hot. So, um, so there's a lot of microclimate uh, characteristics of our Piedmont forests. And speaking of forests and savannas, um, there probably wasn't that much forest in Piedmont historically. So probably for the last um, you know, 3,000 years, it was more of a savanna. The first, and many of you have probably seen this map um, by Delisle, um, but right in the, the area of the Piedmont, the pointer's not working very well, but right in the area of the Piedmont, <clears throat> um, Delisle noted Grand Savannah. So this is uh, plural, so it was many large savannas. Okay, that's what he first saw when he arrived um, as one of the first explorers of this area. And many of you are probably familiar with um, uh, these quotes that uh, Mark Catesby and <clears throat> John Lawson made, talking about fire being important in the, uh, in the ecosystem, that American Indians were setting these fires, and that there were buffaloes, um, there were grasslands. So there were, of course, patches of forest in certain areas where um, fire did not go very frequently. But for the most part, the Piedmont was more of a, a savanna. Um, so don't think of it as Piedmont. A lot of people call this a Piedmont prairie, but <clears throat> um, prairies tend to be rather treeless. Savannas have patches of trees um, throughout those areas. And the fire return in this area of the Piedmont was every four to six years. So fire was very frequent and probably even more frequent uh, because of American Indian uh, burning very regularly. So I grew up in Charlotte and I uh, used to visit friends here in Chapel Hill when I was a kid and I always had my face, you know, plastered to the window looking out and uh, I always uh, was amazed. We would have to drive on Highway 64 and outside of Concord um, there was a buffalo ranch. And so there were buffalo wandering around out there in this savanna um, and this was always my, my early concept of what the Piedmont was like anyway, um, only to learn uh, many years later that this was a concept that uh, is fairly recent. Um, Michael Godfrey um, wrote a book called um, <clears throat> a Field Guide to the Piedmont. I think we still have copies of that in the, our gift shop. 
But um, these are his words, the Piedmont has either been paved, plowed, or is undergoing ecological succession. And that's pretty much the case. This is Orange County in 1938. All of that white area is farmland. So there's way more forest now than there ever was, probably, um, even though that is being compromised um, every day because of development. But, um, but certainly, forests have had to regrow in much of the Piedmont. And this is an example of the industry uh, that occurred in the Piedmont. So tons of industry, tons of development, um, plowing, paving, etc. So now, after that introduction, we'll talk about the understory and um, forest types. So um, there is something called forest structure. So this is the, the vertical um, characterization of a forest where you have the canopy, the midstory uh, or understory, and you have shrubs and the forest floor where the herbaceous layer is. So this is a, a generalized uh, drawing of this and depiction. Um, and like I said, I won't talk too much about the canopy and what are called the emergent trees, the ones, the trees, the really old ones that stick up above the actual canopy, but there is an incredible ecosystem that lives only in the canopy. And this has been recognized over the past uh, 20 years or so of people doing um, actually, you know, canopy studies and uh, finding insects, other invertebrates that only occur in the canopy um, and, and not below. So it's really a remarkable um, location. And by the way, I'm not going to read most of my slides, so I'll let you read uh, a quote from On the Origin of Species. Um, and so, I think Darwin had a really great idea here that you know there was so much going on within any particular area, and that it was um, you know a um, uh, a tangled bank. If I ever had a landscape company, I would probably call it Tangled Bank, but then I'd never get any business. But <laughs> but at any rate, and by the way, I'll put in a plug for uh, the Darwin Day talk which is going to be on Charles Darwin's birthday, February 12th, here at the Garden. It will be, I forget how many we've had now, um, but it'll be close to 20 different uh, Darwin Day talks. And this year is going to be by Mohammed Noor, who is at Duke, who, and who has written books on how um, um, Darwinian theory has influenced science fiction writing, particularly Star Trek. So. Um, Anyway, that will be a virtual talk as well as in-house here on Darwin's birthday. By the way, guess who was born on the same day, just hours apart uh, from Charles Darwin? Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln. Okay, so they were very tight contemporaries, uh, just um, born hours apart. So, talked about vertical structure, and this is just an example of what that kind of looks like. Um, it's hard to capture that in, a, in an image. So, um, but we'll be seeing that out here in, these, in my nature trails. And there's so many things that happen out there. Um, and there's more and more information coming out now on communication among plants within a forest system, especially one that has been undisturbed. So it's, um, well anyway, uh, fungi, incredibly important, nutrient cycling and everything, but it's become more and more, um, and many of you have heard of what's called the wood wide web, um, and if you haven't, uh, this is a fascinating uh, topic of how plants in our forests are communicating with each other through mycorrhizal fungi, uh, those connections. Um, it's just, um, is blow your mind to read some of these um, these books, and don't get the impression that it's like um, the ants in um, uh, in Tolkien's books, um, because there probably isn't a consciousness um, within these plants, but there is certainly communication going on. So um, there, so am I wandering around too much for you? Oh, I'm good. <laughs> Um, I've been neglecting the side of the room a little bit, so I'm going to come over here. But um, anyway, uh, there's evidence that if you go out and you cut the branch off of a tree with 
a pair of clippers, um, you know, there's not much of a signal that goes out uh, to other plants. But if a deer was to browse that, there's something in the saliva that is recognized by the plant, and a signal is sent to plants to produce more tannin to make themselves less edible. So anyway, a lot of stuff going on here, and it's really uh, kind of freaky to think about. Um, but one thing that is um, unfortunate, um, when a forest is disrupted and it is and plowed up, then you're certainly going to disrupt that mycorrhizal association connecting uh, different trees and plants with one another. But certainly there's going to be that mycorrhizal association with any one individual plant and, um, and the soil because that's where trees get many of their nutrients is through this mycorrhizal connection. And um, I'm sure others um, in this Master Naturals class will be talking about that. So herbaceous plants, there's a lot of them, like I already mentioned, in wet pine savannas and their, um, their, um, uh, their diversity. But um, we're not going to see a lot of herbaceous plants today, but there are some evergreen ones that are, um, or winter green ones that are out there right now that we'll be looking at. But so many different plants in the understory. But one thing that fire suppression has caused is the fact that it has shaded out a lot of these um, understory plants that need more light. So fire was really important for this herbaceous layer, especially the ones that require more sun. So I will always go back to thinking about fire as an important um, component of our Piedmont ecosystems, um, including forests. Um, so then there's the shrub layer, um, and really, really important. Um, these are, um, Bob just asked you a question, what shrub is this? Hmm? Not, no, not a buckeye, but pawpaw. Yeah, so it's pawpaw. Let me go back and ask you, what's the plant with the umbrella-like leaf there? Maple. Maple. And one thing that's interesting about maples, I did a study once um, in a, a class, um, and we actually excavated out the rhizome of maple, and this like whole area could be actually one individual uh, maple um, because <clears throat> um, it's rhizomatously connected. So, um, so it's really something to you know you can't really tell what's going on until you dig in sometimes to see uh, what's going on in a forest or any ecosystem. Then there's the shrub layer, which is really important, but we have a diminished shrub layer these days because of, what do you think? I can't hear very well. Deer. Deer. Um, so when I first came to the botanical garden out in our Mason Farm Biological Reserve, I can remember wading through um, almost acres of viburnum and, and now it's gone. And because that viburnum is gone, thanks to the deer, uh, there are no more Kentucky warblers nesting at Mason Farm. So, you know, there's a whole negative cascade of events that occurs when um, some disruption occurs, like for, ins for instance, the eruption of white-tailed deer in our forests. Um, and this might also be one individual pawpaw patch as well. So if you see a big patch of pawpaws, and they're a fairly decent size, and you never see fruits, then it's probably one individual because pawpaws need to be uh, cross-pollinated, and if they're not cross-pollinated, you're not going to get any pawpaws. So uh, this is one patch that for sure um, is a, a clone, uh, one individual, and it could have been through deer predation or something like that that ultimately took out most of the plant. And then there's the saplings. Um, so these are the young trees that have germinated and are um, oftentimes in suspended animation until there's an opening. Um, and they will do all kinds of tricks to get more light. So this is a young sourwood, and you can see how it's arching open. And we'll try and see that today. You can see it in the wintertime. Uh, a lot of trees in the understory will do this arching effect in order to, why, why would they do that? Why would they arch over? Yeah, to maximize the leaf exposure to light. So they lean over and there's this planar effect of having all of these leaves sort of at the same level and not overlapping one another in order to 
maximized photosynthesis. Uh, and so they're, they're just weighed around. Uh, they don't grow much, um, and they just are in suspended animation until um, there is an opening, like I said. And then there's vines. Um, so vines don't grow very big in diameter, but they do grow tall. And there are so many vines around here that are beautiful. Um, some are smaller than others. Uh, some are very tall, get up into the canopy of trees. So uh, we'll see a few vines today as well, but very important for um, the fruits that they produce, the nectar they produce for um, other critters. And then the canopy uh, that I won't talk about, uh, but this is what would be called a mother tree. And one of the ideas about mother trees that's in this, some of these uh, writings about tree communication is that the mother trees will actually help support members of their own species in these mycorrhizal connections. They feed them energy um, in case they're not photosynthesizing enough. Now, of course, this isn't a conscious thing, but you can think about it in terms of natural selection, that that would be something that would be favored um, in terms of um, this particular species being more competitive by nursing your young along. Has anybody ever heard about feeding your children? <laughs> so uh, anyway, uh, I think that that's a very interesting phenomenon. Um, and there's all kinds of other things out there too that we will see some of, but there's lichens and ferns and hornworts and liverworts and slaginella and mosses. So um, the bryophyte communities in our Piedmont forests are really, uh, are really wonderful. And this is an example of one of those gaps I was talking about. So here's a big tree that's fallen, and now all of those saplings, seedlings that have uh, been waiting for mom to die um, um, can now start growing. Uh, so sometimes you have to wait. Uh, it's too bad that we can't, uh, we can wait uh, hundreds of years for our mothers to die. But anyway, um, so. And then uh, I'll go back to fire again. So one of our nature preserves is the Penny Spin Nature Preserve in Durham. And uh, that's me probably 25 years ago making a fire line in an area called the Shortleaf Pine Bluff. And um, uh, so this was an area that was definitely a fire adapted plant community. Um, but it had, through fire suppression for many, many years, it had uh, grown up in mostly southern sugar maples and, and others, but mostly uh, maples. Um, but after a few years of burning, we've opened up this. The herbaceous layer is thriving again, and uh, some of the rare plants that were there as either rootstocks or as seeds in the understory um, are, are thriving. So uh, fire really is important um, in so many of our Piedmont forests. So I can't talk about forests without talking about invasive plants um, because they are real, um, a real problem. And uh, this is a welcome sign to Chapel Hill. Uh, what do you think those white flowered trees are? Grab the pear, that's right. And they are coming up everywhere in forests, um, inside the intact forest, but mostly they're really filling in old fields. Um, now in Orange County um, and in other counties, there's just you know acres and acres of nothing but uh, Bradford pear. And I know you will have um, more talks about invasive organisms um, later on, but I just wanted to point out how things have changed. Um, so this is from the Western <coughs> Forest Service. So look at that map, 2013 on the left versus um, right now, and how these pests have spread. Um, emerald ash borer, spongy moth, uh, quarantine, oral wilt disease, not only can cankers, I mean, it goes on and on. And right now, the one that is really, um, really feeding up our forests is the Asian, um, is the um, emerald ash borer, otherwise known as EAB. Um, so we're losing um, so many of our ashes around here now. It's really really terrible. And my son and I were driving through um, New England um, three years ago. Um, and it was summertime. You could look out and you see all these dead ash trees, you know, as far as the eye could see. Were, and that's 
That's what's happening here. So um, these are serious impacts to our forest, as well as invasive plants. Um, and I won't talk about that too much, but uh, one that is kind of this incipient invasive here called Big Buttercup. And um, we have a Big Buttercup project going on and the North Carolina Invasive Plant Council um, and the Triangle Gardener magazine, and there's a whole stack of them in there, have purchased the back page of this um, for advertisement about this particular project and how to get in touch, how to identify this plant, how to get in touch with the Ficaria Verna Task Force so that um, landowners can be identified, control can be done, because this is a very serious um, um, plant in terms of our understory. Uh, this is just one of the areas where we've concentrated. These are high naturalist um, observations, and so there's a group of us that go out and target, get in touch with landowners and target these sites, get permission to spray, because that's about the only thing you can do to get rid of vicaria. It's very difficult to dig up. So this is just an example along um, New Hope Creek, upper New Hope Creek, of what it looks like in there. Almost everything in the understory is vicaria. Same thing here um, in the bottom picture along Sandy Creek. Um, but then there are other disruptors of our forest too, like in the upper left are helibores that have escaped cultivation. And then of course, um, our favorite grass, microstegium, uh, stilgrass, um, really disrupts those things. And one of the things that North Carolina Basic Plant Council has done is come up with uh, what's called a shun list. So this is a short list of uh, the plants that are most sold in the nursery industry that you should not purchase if you want to help protect um, our forests. Um, now, probably we'll hear more about this as we go along, but what we do in our own homes, in our own home landscapes, has a lot to do with the surrounding forests or the forest that's within your own home landscape. So uh, there are a lot of great resources and um, unless, if you've been hiding under, under a rock, you might not have heard of Doug Ptolemy, but, um, but otherwise, uh, his name is out there with really great resources. And um, I've just become familiar with Nancy Lawson's books, uh, The Humane Gardener. Um, and if you haven't uh, uh, gotten in touch with this resource, it's really, really great. She's um, a great speaker. Um, she was our um, last Sims lecturer here at the Botanical Garden. But her books are very readable and um, very humane. So. And another thing that is becoming very widespread is paying attention to uh, leaving the leaves in your own landscape. So this is very important for forest ecosystems uh, because so many caterpillars um, are overwintering in leaves as well as many, many um, invertebrates. There's resources from our local Audubon Society, and you can see that they have a certified bird-friendly habitat uh, program. So um, I won't go on and on about the home landscape stuff because you will have copies of this presentation you can go back and look at at your leisure. But then there are resources here at the North Carolina Botanical Garden for uh, plants that you can plant and um, etc. So. Um, Appreciating this understory is something that um, we will do in person in a few minutes. But um, again, this is a, a, a May apple, one individual again. Uh, the upper left hand picture, you recognize that? Or upper right hand? Upper right hand. with the fungus, and this is the spor sporulating part of a slime hole. So they very important um, in the soil and in the, well, the leaf litter, they're great decomposers, but when they, uh, when they make spores, when they fruit, as it were, um, they'll, they'll, the plasmodium, this is a, a plasmodial uh, fun fungus that will actually move around in the landscape. And so it will move up onto a place like a tree um, and uh, the spores um, come out there. 
And this was actually a tree I took a picture of. Um, I, I visited a uh, home landscape. A, an arborist told someone they had to cut that tree down because it was diseased. And, I, and this person called me up and said, would you come look at this? I really don't want to cut my tree down. And I said, but that's a slime mold. I said, you know, it's just living on the bark. You know, this is a wonderful thing. So um, understanding the landscape uh, and the critters and uh, plants and fungi and microorganisms is important. The same thing with um, this vernal pool in the lower right-hand side. A lot of people think these are just mosquito breeding areas, but really important for amphibian breeding. And so uh, uh, I recommend paying attention to forest landscape before you go messing around with it. And all the different organisms that live just in the forest, if you spend time just paying attention and just sitting and, and looking around, poking around, sometimes you have to turn over a log, but you got to turn it back um, because there's a whole ecosystem under that log as well. But um, there's marble salamander and box turtles and um, dead snags that are important for um, woodpecker habitat as well as where they get a lot of their food, um, frogs, snakes, um, and then the invertebrates. Um, just so many out there that we're still learning new species every day that surround us in our forests. Um, and insect food. So one of the um, things that's a problem with non-native plants is they have um, a lot of times very few predators. And it's really important to have our trees in our forests being predated. Not necessarily by white-tailed deer all the time, but this was just a little walk I took <coughs> down my driveway. And about 10 feet, I noticed that every single individual plant had some leaf damage because it's feeding something. You know, it's part of the ecosystem and it's really important. So even this little leaf miner on that smilax is really, really important. Um, most of these um, pests do not, and I say pests, um, most of these insects do not act as pests, but rather they will take a little nibble and feed themselves. Um, but then you do have the explosion of true pests like Japanese beetles that will totally defoliate them. But what is really concerning um, is this phenomenon called the insect apocalypse. And um, who knows what's going on, the cause of this is certainly um, more than just a, a backyard thing, but a global phenomenon that is happening that invertebrate numbers are uh, really dropping precipitously. Um, and uh, it's really worrisome. And one of the things that you'll see today on our field trip are some inverted milk jugs that capture caterpillar grass. Uh, a biology professor at UNC, Alan Hilbert, um, has started this program, and it's a nationwide thing, but a lot of this is happening. Um, one of the sites is here at the Botanical Garden, and these are the data for um, the Botanical Garden. You see that graph? There is this really big decline in numbers of caterpillars that are in our forest here. We don't use pesticides here at the Botanical Garden. There's no pesticides that are used in the forest. So why caterpillars are declining precipitously here in an intact reserve um, is really worrisome. So it's probably some landscape level phenomenon that's um, affecting us. So I was driving around Chapel Hill a couple of years ago and there was this um, exterminator car um, advertising and you know, why are they using a red spotted purple, which is one of our fabulous butterflies, as, as advertisement as a, what I would guess would be a pest. Um, so uh, anyway, sending the wrong message here um, with respect to advertising. So I don't have a timepiece on me. You are at like 9.40. Okay, great. So I've been racing along. <laughs> And um, I'll go ahead and just uh, throw out some common understory trees and shrubs and uh, some of the things that we'll see today. But what I'd like for you to do, rather than me tell you about these plants and why they're important or anything, 
you tell me what you know about this plant and why you think it's special or why it's interesting or something um, interesting about that. So, red bud, common understory tree. Uh, well, I'll, I'll start out telling you something interesting. Um, you see what looks like little hole punches in that red bud leaf? Do you know what that is? It's a leaf cutter bee that only uses red bud to provision its nest. So um, uh, it's really incredible to think that uh, you know these little hole punches are being used by a bee, and there are lots. And um, I know that Elsa Youngstead and others will talk about um, insects and um, and their uh, their ways. But that just blew me away when I learned about that. So tell me something interesting about red bud. The what? The flowers, are the flowers are edible. And what do they taste like? Hmm? In the pea family. Yes, in the pea family. They taste just like a bean sprout or something. Uh, they're a great thing to put on a salad. So, yeah, that's great. Thank you for that. Anything else? They yeah. come out before the leaves start. Yeah, the leaves um, come out <clears throat> after it flowers. Um, that's a picture I took um, the last time it snowed uh, here. Um, and um, so we can even have a late snow with uh, red bud flowers on. So why is why do there are a lot of understory trees and shrubs that flower before the leaves come out? And why do you think that? What's the adaptation for that? Um, it's the stuff that pollinated on it. They break dorm like the bees break dormancy. <coughs> the very few things for them to pollinate on. They start to pollinate, but if they're Yeah, exactly. Um, also, um, uh, it starts sort of that pollinator cycle. So pollinators can't all just sort of emerge at once when things are flowering. So there's something called sequential flowering, which is really important in ecosystems. So some things are going to flower early, the pollinators get started, um, and then there's this sequential flowering of all kinds of plants in a forest. Um, that will keep those pollinators fed throughout their life cycle. So this is just the very beginning of that. So there's red bud, persimmons. Um, this is a plant that, well, you tell me about persimmons. Mm -hmm. uh, there's their old wives tale of persimmons. Right. So there's two different kinds of seeds inside a persimmon, the spoon-shaped one and the What's the other shape? Spoon, fork, and knife. Yeah, spoon, fork, and knife. Okay. And um, I think studies have shown that that's not particularly uh, useful. <laughs> uh, but nonetheless, it's fun, that, uh, those different seed types. And it's obviously an important food for, for what? Well, that's, that's some scat on the left lower. Yeah, that's, um, that's coyote. Um, but there's possums and raccoons and you know all kinds of things are eating those seeds um, and they do go through the digestive system and they germinate better if they do um, rather than just planting them and that's my son who's now older than that um, eating a persimmon long ago anything else about persimmons cool looking bark sort of square fragmented yeah, um, they have really beautiful bark um, and have kind of alligator-like uh, skin bark. Um, have you ever eaten an unripe persimmon? Uh, that's uh, yeah, that's a hard that's a hard bite for sure. Uh, French tree, Chinensis virginicus. This is a beautiful flowering tree in our understory, and this has male and female plants. Uh, it's dioecious. Um, anything else about trench tree that you know about? It's one of pretty fragrance. It's what, I'm sorry? They have a pretty fragrance. Yes, they have incredible fragrance. Uh, very delicate. Um, and it's a great landscape plant, but um, we have lots of native trench tree around here. But one thing that is uh, worrisome is that 
this is in the same family as ashes, the, the Oleaceae. And so when these get large enough, emerald ash borer can affect them. Hog plum, which is a, not very common um, right around here because it mostly grows on more basic soils. Um, but it's one of those plants that flowers early, early, early in the spring and insects come out and start pollinating that early on and start to build that insect and uh, pollinator population. And it also has very beautiful bark. Service berry, where did it get its name? Why is it called service berry? That's right. So you can start having a service once they're flowering. It's an indication that the, the ground is thawed enough to dig holes to plant people. Um, so, um, and it's also called shad bush because supposedly um, the shads start running when um, service berries flower. And flowering dogwood. Any fun facts about flowering dogwood? That's the one that's actually being attacked by some kind of anthracnose, is that right? Yeah, there's a fungus, a non-native fungus that's affecting it, dogwood anthracnose, that, um, that is pretty serious, um, especially in the understory because you don't have as much air circulation in your understory as you would in a dogwood planted in the open. And so that fungus has done a real number on uh, plants growing inside the forest. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yes, I have heard something about that. The fact that it has a high concentration of calcium in the leaves, and so it helps fertilize itself when it drops those leaves. Anything else? That's right. So the berries are really, um, uh, they're high in fat and also um, protein. And that's another problem with invasive plants. Many of the plants like Heliagnus species um, and others, they have a lot of high, they have a high carbohydrate content, simple carbohydrates. So they're sweet tasting. And birds oftentimes will prefer the sweet tasting rather than the native shrubs and trees like dogwoods, um, viburnums and others that are high in protein and fat um, because a lot of these fruit during fall migration. And so those birds need to bulk up on cheeseburgers rather than eating candy bars. Um, so that's really important. And I threw this in. Um, that's me uh, a few years ago um, hugging the national champion flowering dogwood, which is in Clinton, North Carolina. It is a tremendous tree. So if you're ever down east in Clinton, um, there's a cemetery there that has this national champion flowering dogwood. Sourwood, we'll see lots of sourwoods today. How many have tasted a sourwood leaf? So, um, so it's, it's fun, it's a fun thing to do. Um, the smaller leaves that are coming out are the tender ones and the best ones to, um, to take. Maples. Things grow in the air. A red maple can grow in the more acidic soil or the mucous soil. The red maples just they'll just grow. They they grow a lot of places. They yeah. Don't take down. So probably this is the tree that is has the widest um, range of where it can occur. It can occur in the driest of dry places or the or wet places with wet feet. So, um, but if you're shopping for a maple, a red maple, it's important to know from where it came because they're adapted to different places. So, um, if you have um, 
you go to a nursery, you get a maple that came from a wetland genotype, um, then when you plant in a dry area, it's not going to do very well. So um, that's one, well, I won't go into um, another story about that, but at any rate, um, it's important to know. Uh, so there are genotypic uh, effects of different plants that you use in the landscape, and it's almost impossible to figure out where, what that is um, uh, when you're buying plants from a nursery oftentimes. Uh, the southern sugar maples, we'll talk about that a bit. Um, hop horn bean, um, which is a common understory tree around here. We'll probably see some of those. Uh, beautiful flowers, that's why they're called um, hop horn bean, because the flowers, the inflorescence looks like that of hops. It's used in uh, flavoring beer. Um, so what's the time now? Um, ten till. Ten till, okay. Uh, muscle wood or ironwood, carpinus, carolinena. Anything interesting about this? Mm -hmm. I read this. I read because of the, 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 the a lot of the population is decimated because people are so frustrated because it, it, it just dulled their saw blades and they just tried to eradicate them because they were such a a pain in the butt. Um, it's a sad spot. Yeah, wow, I didn't know that. Well, I will say it's very close related, even though they don't look exactly alike from bark wise. But hop horn bean has really hard wood too. And um, I tried to make my son's partner a spoon for Christmas this year. And I cut down a small one um, that was actually encroaching on my house. So I took that out and I carved, I was going to carve her a spoon, but she's left-handed and I was going to make her a left-handed spoon, uh, scoop. Um, I didn't even know that there was such a thing, you know, like there was this, you know, I'm so right-handed that, you know, I'm, I'm always thinking everything's right-handed, right? But um, anyway, so I started carving this and it is like carving a rock. Um, so, no, and I'm still not finished with it. I had to show her this half-finished spoon at Christmas time. <laughs> but anyway, it is like, uh, it is hard as a rock. So, and, um, there's no way to carve it once it's dry, which is really hard when it was green. And the same thing with muscle wood. Yeah, it's very hard wood. And the bark is really, or the trunk is really beautiful because it's fluted and, um, and looks actually like, you know, a muscle. Not my muscles, uh, but maybe somebody's somebody's muscles. That's a grass. I will boldly say this is my favorite tree. So, anything interesting about sassafras? Different shaped leaves. Hmm? Different shaped leaves. Yeah, they have three different shaped leaves. They have ones that look like a mitten, and then there's ones that are three lobed, and then there's ones that are entire. Um, and do you know why this has been speculated? There are three different shaped leaves on sassafras. Well, one theory is that it mimics insect damage on the leaf. And so when a bird is looking for something to eat, it says, ooh, um, there's some insect on there eating that leaf. And so they'll go to that tree, but at the same time, insects looking for a place to lay eggs that will eat leaves, don't go there because um, insects think, okay, somebody else is already there, so I'm not gonna lay my egg on that tree. So, so sassafras has two ways of keeping um, predators from, from eating it, from deterring them and also attracting birds that are looking for insects. And the roots were historically used for making root beer has that nice um, root beery type um, flavor. And the fruits are very attractive. You don't oftentimes get to see these, um, but uh, they have this, uh, the, the calyx, or the, not the calyx, the um, receptacle of the fruit is red, and the fruit itself is very dark purple, um, blue. So it has this aposematic coloration that attracts birds to, um, to, to eat it. Aposomatic, meaning um, contrasting, 
colors or shapes. That word is used a lot when um, uh, you're talking about um, butterflies that have, or anything that has um, bright colors or insects that um, that supposed to display that they are dangerous, they have a stinger or they taste bad. And so a lot of brightly colored insects, um, it's a warning uh, coloration. And then big leaf magnolia, this is a true Piedmont plant. Um, uh, if there's no, I don't think that there are any native populations around here, but it is common in the Piedmont around the Charlotte area in Concord, um, and then travels down uh, around and then up into um, the Gulf Coast. But it has a fun fact about this. Yes, it has the largest simple leaf of any plant in North America. So um, they call it big leaf magnolia because the leaves can be as much as a, a meter long. And then pinkster flowers, Rhododendron parish um, We will hopefully see some today. They have beautiful buds that are about ready to, to flower. So I'm thinking I'm just going to scroll through the rest of these and then we'll take a short break and then run outside for our field trip. Uh, with hazels, important understory tree, they flower in the fall so um, and in the winter. Um, and so they also provide, on a warm day when these are flowering, you'll see insects on them. It's amazing. Um, Ilexes, uh, we have uh, two common species around here. Uh, Euonymus, Arctobustin, very important understory plant, um, but they're really love it. It's hard to keep it around. Uh, spice bush, um, very common in our bottom lands. We'll see some today, hopefully. Uh, viburnum species, um, deer love those too, um, but we have three species um, that are common. We have about six species around our area. Um, here's an understory picture I took of viburnum this past fall, uh, just thick with viburnums, um, just really beautiful in the fall. And then sumacs, really important um, bird food. Fragrant sumac, um, it's related to poison ivy, but not uh, poisonous, as it were, uh, very fragrant leaf. And poison ivy, who would think that it would be a beautiful fall color plant Give me a fun fact about poison ivy fruits. Birds like it, and more different birds eat poison ivy fruits than any other fruit. Um, so it's really important bird food. And I just saw someone post on a, uh, the Audubon Facebook page of a pileated woodpecker eating poison ivy berries. So. So who knew woodpeckers ate fruits like that? Uh, sweet shrub, um, not too common around here, but an important understory plant. And it has really interesting fruits. These are actually not fruits, but this is um, uh, um, the receptacle of the flower that grows into a fruit-like structure. Um, and you have the seeds inside that. So, this is indehiscent, meaning it doesn't split open, and will hang on to the plant for a long time, um, or get knocked off. And a lot of these flower, or a lot of these occur near waterways, near streams. And so I'm thinking that that would be it's like a little boat that can disperse this um, down streams. And we've already talked about pawpaws, um, but very important for a particular um, uh, butterfly. This. Uh, this Zebra swallowtail, it's a specific host plant for, um, for that insect. And now we can take a break and go on a field trip.